All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our second edition of Cook Food for the Chakras. Um, I'm really glad to be here again with my dear sister witch, Arielle. Hello. Yes. And, um, you know, I hope that everybody was able to tune in last week or at least catch the replay. I had to catch the replay myself of Jenny Biondo and Delia talking about the sacral chakra, which is where we are, which is why I'm in orange. <laughs> um, and it was a beautiful conversation, um, you know, discussing the, uh, you know, just the various aspects of the sacral chakra, what it represents and how we can heal through things like crystals and oils. And so I hope you catch the replay of that. Um, and there was also a wonderful activation by a second Jenny B um who you know led through a wonderful you know a clearing and um i just i highly recommend um tuning into that episode so today we're going to be exploring how we can look at the sacral chakra also called the swanasthana chakra which is the the seat of our womb so this is below our navel you know our womb space above the root chakra and looking at how we can heal through foods and um you know just exploring all those different aspects in which um you know we can use to clear ourselves of any blocks that may exist there now um you know i i want this to be interactive so please everybody ask questions and, and participate with us um and ariel is there anything that you want to say by way of introduction oh um yeah my name is ariel yabek i'm um it's always kind of like, what am I? Okay, well, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I'm for for my day job. I'm a mental health practitioner. I'm a, a mother to a beautiful bright light. Um, she'll be six in July, Dahlia. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm very engaged in my own healing practices. I work a lot with stones and crystals. They're very dear to me and they facilitate a lot of uh, my own like deep journey inner work so yeah i'll just say that for now thank you speaking of stones and crystals i was thinking that i like i always keep them you know oh. Oh, oh. <laughs> and so i have this brand of moonstone here which right. broke on me so it's sitting you know in my nice little pocket that i have uh -huh. um, moonstone is one of the great ones for the sacral chakra as well um and so i'm keeping that near and dear to me um <laughs> Uh, my I, would, I would be I would be very happy to be that strand of moonstone right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful pocket to hold a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, my name is Vanita. Uh, I am a you know I'm a person in transition right now, which mm. is really interesting. I um, I've trained as a molecular biologist. That's what I've done for so long, and I was in scientific communications for over a decade and last year I left my career and I have been discovering who I am. Mm. I remembered that I am a medicine witch and food is my medicine. Mm. And you know, I've been on this journey and path of healing and I've been cooking for my entire life and I really love blending science, spirituality, food and especially our chakras, the healing, the healing that we can do with our body. When we are optimized in our individual health there's no health that's you know health regime that's you know for everybody you have to find your individual health right. and when we're optimized in our individual health then we can live our greatest life we can be in service to others and service yeah. to health and service to this earth so i'm here to help people find what's right for them and I help, you know, educate about food and about the qualities that are in our food and encourage you to be conscious about what you eat and what you put into yourself. Mm, so, <laughs> speaking of consciousness and, you know, what we put into ourselves and what we intake, you know, obviously there's a lot of energy out there right now. Um, there's a lot going on in the world. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, we touch base with this because, it's such an important part of, you know, our clearing that we're going through as humanity. It's no coincidence that we've been talking about the root and sacral chakra during the time when we are going through this 
global unearthing. Uh, you know, it started with COVID and, you know, now we have moved on to really something that is so deep in our roots of who we are as a humanity and as a society. And, you know, it's, it's essential that we're breaking down all of these systems. It's essential that we are clearing and bringing to the surface all that exists. Um, you know, as a person of color myself, I've experienced a lot of racism throughout my life. And it's something that has been an everyday occurrence for me and something that I've been conscious of. But it really wasn't until 9-11. I'm, I'm from New Jersey, New York, and was living in Manhattan at the time when 9-11 happened. And I watched the second plane hit. I watched both towers fall. I you know, went through that all. But it really wasn't until that time that I understood what it meant to have people hate you for the color of your skin. There's one thing to be, you know, have people, you know, direct comments of ignorance or, you know, their personal beliefs at you. It's another thing to have people look at you differently because of the color of your skin. And that was the first time that I truly experienced that. And that's really what it's like for a Black person almost anywhere in the world, right? It's really prevalent in places like Western societies, places like America. But I don't want us to think that this is just an American issue. This is something that we really have to unearth as a global humanity. You know, this is something that runs deep. I was shocked when I went to Ethiopia in January to find how pervasive that racism is there too. I mean, I've seen it in India. I've seen it other places. The, you know, the lighter your skin, the, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, the higher social status, maybe the the better you're perceived. Even in Ethiopia, listening to way, the way they would talk about uh, people of their own culture, you know, their own people just because they had darker skin. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it's something that is been, you know, because of, you know, way that we, I guess, as humanity has evolved and, and made a certain skin color more preferable. I don't know what, like, you know, there's been this, you know, racism that exists everywhere. And so it's really important that we address this and that we continue to work. And I want to really em emphasize that racism is so pervasive that it's not enough just to say that you're not racist. Anti-racism has to be taught. It has to be learned. It's something that we have to do that work for ourselves. So it's, you know, while it might make sense to really, you know, talk to some people and ask them, you know, like, what should I do? What should I do? And especially maybe to a Black person, that might be a desire to go out and say, like, what should I do? What's the best thing for me to do? Start with the self. Because remember that they're experiencing all this trauma. They're going through the anger, the grief, everything that we are all going through. They're going through it 10 times more. So I just ask that we start with the self. Ask, what is it that I can do to make lasting changes, to really do that shadow work? Where do I need to change myself? And there's so many resources out there to help you like there are so many books and podcasts and blog posts that can help you take that first step so it's you know rather than looking to people to be your teacher learn to guide yourself because we are empowered we have that information and we can take those steps i work with my daughter my daughter is a mixed race child and she looks white and we have to discuss her white privilege and this is something that's really hard for her but it is up to us to be the leaders in this. And I know that with this community of witches, with the people that are tuning in, I know that we're all capable of transforming this conversation and really, really digging in to that root and sacral chakra, that, that foundation of humanity that we are and really bringing about this new earth and this new way of being. So I don't know if you have anything to say. I do. I mean, well, firstly, I, I want to say thank you for devoting this time um, prior to getting started. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I think the other thing I wanna add as a white woman is that it's not enough to even just read books uh, mm -hmm. or listen to podcasts, that to do the work isn't the intellect intellectualization of reading and absorbing information. If it doesn't involve a pen and a paper, 
and your own journaling of your own life experiences and your own internalized white supremacy, you're not actually doing the work. So I just wanna add that piece. It has to include that piece, okay? So yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's really important because I think that it's really none of us, nobody, unless we live in that skin color, there's no way to truly understand that systemic oppression that exists. And what an everyday life, you know, day in the life of somebody who has to go through that, thinking about who they are in society, when they leave their house, when they're interacting with other people, when they're driving their car, they get pulled over by a cop for something innocent. Like everything is so different. And so I love that concept of journaling, doing that shadow work, really understanding what it is to the privileges that we have. You know, it's forced me to recognize my privilege of, you know, being a person of color, but not necessarily being viewed the same way. And so we have to do that work continually. It's not a one-time deal. It's not something that's going to go away. This yeah. is our, you know, We've had a thousand wake up calls. This is long overdue and now we're in it for the long haul. So it's really important that we do this work daily and recognize yep. it. And doing the work is like, you're doing the work for yourself, right? I mean, you're doing it for the collective. You're doing the work for yourself and that we're most potently in our power when we're doing our work, okay? So the nervous system loves truth even if it's painful, agonizing truth, okay? And the nervous system is soothed by truth. And so for all you witches out there, it's like to be in alignment with your truth is very powerful. That means that you're in resonance with yourself, which means you can hone and laser beam your energy in the ways that you need to for the higher good, which means you have to do the deep, dark, dirty shadow work. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but I'm just saying I've learned that piece, so. Yeah. Absolutely, and it's exhausting. And you know, yeah. as we've been saying, this is this is work and it's in it for the long haul. So yeah. don't chastise yourself if you need a break, if you need rest, we all need rest. So it's important to learn how to rest without quitting. And that's, you know. Well, I, I love that. that, rest without quitting. Yes. That's beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you, you all. Olivia and everybody who just absorbed our, our spell. <laughs> right? Exactly. I mean, we, it's, a, you know, it's really important. We do cast spells with all of our words and we're such in a potent time of manifestation right now. So this is such a wonderful time to speak the truth, to be honest with who you are, cast spells of empowerment. You know, I like to say, ask yourself empowering questions rather than go downwards in that spiral of like feeling overwhelmed and like, what should I do? And, you know, think about like, what can I do? What is that step that I can take to make a better society? What is that step that I can take to change myself? And let, let your spirit guides, let your ancestors, let all of the universal forces guide you. Because mm. if you listen closely, you will hear the answer within yourself. So ask empowering questions and, and let the answers come to you and live by that. All That's, right. Uh, so shall we discuss the pleasure center? <laughs> yeah. You want me yeah. to read my card? Yes. Yeah, should I do that? Yeah, shall we take a breath first, actually? Yes, let's just let's let's do that. that. You know, and I think it's I think it's so wonderful to start off with a breath of clean air. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. <sighs> mm. That's good. Okay. I love how a simple breath can reset the nervous system. I love it. <laughs> well, last time, Benita pulled a couple cards, and I offered this time to pull a card. And so right before we went live, um, I pulled a card from this really special deck that I have with its accompanying book. I don't know if you all can see it. Way of the Horse. Ooh. So I've been working with horse medicine. Um, I've been working with real horses. Um, and so this is a book of Equine Archetypes for Self-Discovery by Linda Kohanov. 
she sounds like maybe one of my Jewish descendants or something. Mm -hmm. um, and the illustrations are incredible by Kim McElroy. So I pulled a card and it is this. Oh, how beautiful. And this is called Merlin's Spirit, Redemption of the Masculine, Mutual Transformation, The New Hero's Journey. Two stallions, father and son, meet on common ground. The heart between them gathers strength as they share the breath of life. Hot hope springs from the depths of an ancient wound, causing even the stones to weep. I have two white UPS men at my door. <laughs> Can I help you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Life in action, always, always going on. I'm grateful for our delivery men. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, yes, right? Okay, so yeah. um, the gift is the power and gentleness find a new way to coexist, balance, and finally heal the immense injustices perpetrated by and on the masculine body, mind, and spirit. And the challenge is true masculinity has been twisted, tortured, and betrayed by a culture of conquest and consumerism. It's hard to fathom what a peaceful, healthy form of virility might look like. To have any hope of changing the world, men and women, I'll just add all genders, must reevaluate and re-socialize the active masculine principle within their own families and their own psyches to tasks requiring significant soul searching and imagination. That's beautiful. And so this feels especially potent with what's going on and the way that um, white supremacy really has um, very deliberately and explicitly and even quietly and insidiously undermined and annihilated the divine masculine. Um, in black men and women and in many others as well. So I'll just say like what resonated for me on a very deeply personal level around that is just the way that like um, during the Holocaust, I would say probably 80 to 90% of my living family at the time was uh, persecuted and murdered. And just the way that that really did annihilate the divine masculine in the generations to follow and the way that the trauma impacted the way that the men were able to like really stand in their power. So that's just my own observation for my own lineage. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, it actually, you know, it, it's so relevant to, I think, you know, what we're dealing with in terms of the sacral chakra and this concept of, you know, this is where we are interacting with the outside world, right? Like we start with our foundation, with our tribe, our roots, our ancestors, and we move on up. And that, that's when we get to this kind of, you know, place, of, you know, it's often thought of, you know, as the sexuality, sensuality, creativity. But this is coming through this concept of relationship to, to another, to the other, to the outside world moving outside of our tribe and interacting with those beyond our tribe. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, we can have that balance when we have the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine, like, you know, harmonized and united, then we have that healthy relationship with the world. And I think that we have been in an imbalance lately. And so there has been that kind of return to the womb, the female womb, the earth mother, mother's wound that we need to have to kind of come back you know you have to swing from one side when you, when you swung to one side you got to swing so far to the other way right. in order to come back into the middle right. and you know it's interesting that you know you brought this up one of my pieces of shadow work that i've been working through and i kind of went through you know over the last week was recognizing that i really have a deep-seated anger towards men and it was recognizing how this was from my upbringing and from my father and you know he had his he had his hatred towards women and like mine then manifested in towards you know anger towards men 
And it manifests in the most subtle ways sometimes. And like having to kind of reel myself back and be the observer and see that so that I can honor not only the divine masculine on the outside, but also in the inside, mm -hmm. because we all have that within ourselves. And I can tell you while I was in corporate, I was definitely exercising that masculine part of myself because that's what I had to do to survive in corporate. And so you have to be able to honor the masculine, not only for, you know, the men and, you know, those that identify as men on the outside, but that is something that we have to identify and bring into balance within ourselves. And so I, I really appreciate that card being pulled because I think we are dealing with a lot of, you know, what's happening in society as, you know, the toxic masculinity and how that can manifest and there is a divine masculine and that's what we are bringing forth and how that can be used to uplift the feminine and so it's wonderful because we are talking about the sacral chakra and like i said this idea of um, creativity and you know sensuality and sexuality and our expression with one another um, what we're going to actually make today is a butternut squash risotto made out of sunflower seeds. There's no grains in this recipe. And it's because I know that, you know, there's a lot of people who, you know, we all have our dietary restrictions and we all have different ways of exploring food. And what I really love about this recipe is that it's taking something that we know, which is rice, and you know, looking at it in different ways. This is that creativity. How can we create something? How can we transform something that we know into something else? So sunflower seeds are great. They're easier to do than risotto. You don't have to labor hours over the stove. It's much quicker. And you know, it provides a nutritional value that we wouldn't necessarily get out of the grain, that rice. Um, and I'm going to be using also, I'm going to be making a shiitake bacon. And the reason why I wanted to include the mushrooms is because as we've been talking about with the, the sacral chakra, there's this interaction with the world. There's this interaction with, uh, there's this idea of connection, right? Like we are coming into our own creative power we're coming into our understanding of our gifts our life force but then we're also looking at it to be in relationship to one another it's this connectivity now the the mushroom is like just such a amazing organism, organism right? <laughs> it's not an animal and it's not a plant it's yeah. its own fungi they're fun mm -hmm. and they are you know i i don't know how much people know there's a wonderful movie called the fantastic fungi i highly recommend watching it but um you know there's the mycelial network that like goes through all of the ground that we're on. This is the network through which plants communicate to one another and mm. signal to one another. It's the internet system of the plants. But if you think about it, it's a re like representation of nature. We have it in our circulatory system. We have it like we are constantly communicating with different parts of our body. They're constantly communicating. And adapting, with right? Say that again. And adjusting. And adjusting and reacting. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I, I, you know, I like to use shiitake mushrooms. So shiitake mushrooms are wonderful for, you know, what we know as the umami flavor. You know, this is that fifth taste, you know, there's bitter, salt, sweet. What am I missing? Salt, sweet, bitter. Uh, sour and umami being the um, the fifth taste, and you know for the longest time they weren't sure if umami was like just a combination of the different receptors, you know, of the tongue. But now they're understanding it's its own thing, and what it's actually you know responding to is. Um, you know, a chemical compound in this that, you know, eventually leads to an amino acid called glutamic acid, which is something that we need in our body to build protein. Now, it's, you know, it's what gives the, you know, that like robust flavor to food when you're like, oh, that just that feels like nothing was missing. There's, you know, a completion in that food. There's that earthiness um, that comes from the umami. And so shiitakes are a great way to do it. So I like to use fresh shiitake when I can find it. Um, you'll often find them with a the stem. Um, the stems are really fibrous. So I take them out. And then I use them, as you remember, I think Ariel said that you oh, yeah. made stock, right? Oh, so I made the best broth 
ever. Food stock? Yes. Yeah. So okay. it's wonderful. You just save, like, you know, when you add shiitake stems to, like, I put this all in a bag. I, you know, I got my onion peels in there. I got garlic peels, all the peels, all the other stuff that you don't use. Then you um, add that to your soup stock. You, you know, boil it for 40 minutes to a couple of hours. How you can even leave it on the stove. It's fine. You're just taking out all the nutrients out of all these leftover things. And then you end up with a wonderful stock. Now, this is the stock that I have, and this is what I'm going to be using for this risotto. And so it's wonderful because you're using everything. You're reducing the waste. You're getting all the nutrition out of food. Now, if you cannot find um, fresh shiitake, you can always buy dried shiitake. And dried shiitake comes, it has, you know, it's so, I can't even see if you can see that. That's but, good. Um, <laughs> what? No, that was good. The stock yeah. is good. So, so, you know, you'll find them with and without stems. Again, I suggest that like, you know, here, for example, this is, you know, a, a cap with a stem. Taking off the stem because it's extremely fibrous and you'll find yourself kind of like trying to get through it and it's just not pleasant. So use the stems for your stock. Um, and, you know, if you use dried shiitake, just rehydrate it, boiling water for 20 minutes and then that's good. Um, so I just want to, you know, get started to, because we've got things that have to marinate, things that have got to bake. And so, you know, I'd love to just kind of talk through the sacral chakra and, you know, what the different aspects are as we're cooking. Um, and I, I want to also quickly mention that, you know, there's, there's multiple ways to kind of use food to heal our chakras. And, you know, one is through color. You know, I'm wearing orange. Orange is represented. Um, that's how the sacral chakra is re represented. That's the vibrational frequency that it's emitting. Um, you know, when I understand it from, you know, the levels of density as we're going through ascension, um, you know, the second chakra is when the elements that are represented in the root, fire, water, earth, air, um, start to form, you know, compounds. And this is when we get to plant an animal. So this is, you know, where, you um, where we are starting to come into consciousness that's a different form and as you will go up into the solar plexus this is when we get into things like free will and choice and that's human but one of the things that we can do is use color to you know clear our chakras and if you tuned in last week or caught the replay you know that was something that um Delia and jenny were talking about the use of color therapy and so you can do this with the foods like you know peaches and nectarines Apricots are great, mangoes. When we get into savory things, turmeric. Turmeric is, you know, the wonder food. I have it tattooed, curcumin, sorry, roll one, tattooed on me. It's the active ingredient in turmeric. Um, so that's the most awesome, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, I have turmeric and capsaicin. Those are, capsaicin is the active ingredient in chili pepper. Those are, you know, it took me so long to realize food was my path. And I mean, I've had these tattooed on me for like over a decade. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Food has always been the healing. So turmeric, turmeric is wow. great. Add turmeric to everything. Add it to your soup stock just a little bit. And, you know, it, it acts as a preservative. It's an antibacterial, antifungal, antimicrobial. It's great. So, wow. you know, those are the foods that we can use. There's also, you know, squashes are great. You know, here's a kabocha squash. I love squashes because they have so many nutrients and so much fiber. They're also different. We're going to be using butternut squash because butternut squash is really sweet, um, sweeter than you think it would be. And it's actually, you know, when you get like pumpkin puree, most of it is usually butternut squash because it's actually mm -hmm. sweeter than pumpkin. So um, we're going to be using that. And it's a great, um, you know, way to add fiber to your diet. It's a great way to add sweetness. Um, you know, sweet potatoes. So these are all different foods that we can use. Um, and one of the, I'm going to put this away so it's out of my way. I love your kitchen, Benita. Huh? I love your kitchen. I know, right? Talk about an improvement. For anybody who didn't know, we went through a massive flood last year, seven months without a kitchen while we had to gut the entire thing because of black mold and everything. Um, this is when I say be, you know, you set your intentions and you manifest what you want. Um, I had been saying since we moved into this house 10 years ago, I would love to redo the kitchen, but I couldn't justify the finances. And then the universe was like, here you go, figure it out. <laughs> so, here you go. 
You know, we actually this finished two weeks before we went into quarantine. So I am so grateful because it has allowed me to really settle into this kitchen. You know, I'm grateful that it was completed. I think about all the people who, you know, are struggling for food and, you know, I try to be a source to provide for people in need. Um, so I'm grateful to have this kitchen. Um, the other thing that I want to quickly mention before we get into cooking is that the sacral chakra is also represented by water. That's the element, you know, that's, uh, you know, that comes into play with this chakra, which makes sense when you think about sexuality and creativity, you know, it's very watery, you know, that's where we talk about our creative juices. And so we want to hydrate, we want to, you know, take a lot of water. I love coconut water. I eat coconuts nonstop, you know, um, but coconut water is great for that. I also, you know, hydrate using water. I'm really understanding the importance of healthy water. We are really blessed when we have access to tap water. We're really blessed when we can, you know, improve that. And I've been very lucky to be able to improve our water. You know, we have filtration systems throughout the house that are removing hard water. I also use canyon water. I'm just going to turn this here. You know, I've got a canyon machine. That's structured water. And structured water helps us to um, absorb and hydrate ourselves better. It's, it has, you know, part of it is the alkalinity. But um, sometimes when we buy alkaline water that's bottled, it's not true alkalinity. They're just using, you know, chemicals to kind of change the pH. But what we want to do is actually change the way the water is structured in order to get it into our cells better. And if anybody has any questions about Kangen water, structured water, you know, reach out to me and I'm happy to talk you through that. But, um, but I really, you know, want to make sure is that we're grateful that we, we bless our food, we bless our water, we put energy into it, you know, because I think that we we don't always have access to the best. We, you know, this is something that we see, especially with, you know, racial disparities and different things. There's food deserts, right? People who don't have access to healthy food, people who don't have um, access to, you know, clean water. I mean, in this country, it seems like it's absurd that we can be talking about the fact that people don't have access to clean water. So, um, you know, with whatever you have, whatever you have that is, you know, that you can use, even if you, you know, can only get a takeout meal, just put the intention into your food, treat your food with respect, because what you do is you, you know, you alchemize this in your body. So just, just do what you can to make that food the best that you can eat, whatever you have access to. And if you have the privilege to, you know, eat healthy food, then do that. But no matter what, just always be grateful for the food you have and put that energy into your glass of water, put that energy into the food that you're making and use your hands, play with food, touch it, you know, enjoy it. That's the sensual part of this all. <laughs> all, right. all right well i just want to quickly get started on this shiitake bacon so i know everybody loves bacon i'm a vegetarian i haven't eaten bacon in probably like 22 years um and i remember i used to love it too and really what it comes down to in the end is texture and taste right and so i have found that you can make this with shiitakes and it's just so simple so i just have here is a bowl of coconut oil that um, i have about two tablespoons of coconut oil now one of the things that i like to do when i cook is not really use measurements now when you're baking that might be something different but like when you're cooking you get to play with your food and i always say use your intuition learn to play with the ingredients that you have so you can learn how they add complexity or take away and how much you need to add it's experimentation i'm not a scientist so i like to experiment but <laughs> Um, so the key to anything that is like smoky flavor like bacon is liquid smoke. I hope you know that even the animal that you're eating does not have a natural smoky flavor. They are using hickory. So that's what this is. Make hickory into a liquid form and you can put it into anything. So um, I'm just going to add, you know, you add about like three fourths of a teaspoon. I'm uh, just doing a squeeze or so in. <laughs> And then I'm using toasted sesame oil. Yum. Yes, toasted sesame oil. I mean, sesame seeds, 
you know, one of the things with the sacral chakra too is they talk about um, getting like nuts and seeds. And if you think about it, I like to think about our organs, right? Like this is where our ovaries are. This is, you know, the testicles. This is, you know, where we have the seeds, the seeds of life. And so seeds and nuts are really good and you can get them, you know, use them however when thinking about the sacral chakra. Um, I also have coconut aminos here. So um, you can use like Bragg's aminos, liquid aminos. Um, I like to use coconut aminos. Bragg's actually makes a coconut aminos as well. The only difference between the coconut aminos and the regular liquid aminos is one is soy based and the other one is coconut based. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing wrong with the soy based ones when you're talking about fermented soy. There's nothing wrong. There's actually nothing wrong with soy. It's just gotten a bad rap. Um, and we can discuss that some other time. <laughs> um, so I'm just mixing this up. Now you can see because of the oil, it doesn't really mix together. So you just do your best with getting that all mixed up. And I'm gonna add a pinch of salt. Now I'm gonna post these recipes to, um, you know, to the, uh, the feed once it uh, posts. But, um, you know, just like I said, you know, this is more about learning to play with your food. So once you make this mixture, what you're going to do is you're going to slice the shiitake into its stems. Now, I use about three to five counts. I mean, sorry, spices, not spices. So I'm slicing these, you know, just into little slices like this. Um, and you're going to add this into your uh, marinade over here. And just let it sit for about 20 minutes. And what you're going to see is it's going to move from like the sponginess of the shiitake, of the normal mushroom, into, um, you know, something that's a little more mushy. And it holds together really well. So I'm just curious if there's any comments, if anybody has any questions. Um, your stock is gorgeous. Oh, thank you. Tattoos, yay tattoos. Um, I don't see any questions just yet. All right. Well, yeah. hey, well keep moving on. Yeah. So, Ariel, like when you think of the sacral chakra, what do you think about? Well, it's interesting, and I think that we touched on this. Um, in a previous conversation that we just had personally around um, when you were talking about mushrooms and saying how when I'm doing my womb meditation, I feel like my womb has an intelligence. And we were talking about how the mushrooms, you know, how they have their own intelligence. And so, yeah, I really, I mean, I've definitely been fine tuning uh yeah, a womb meditation that really helps me anchor into my body first and foremost. And um, I find that, yeah, like with practice, I can hear the messages that are coming from my womb where there's a lot of um, pain for sure. Um, not just from my life, but from the womb, of my mother, where I came from and the womb of her mother where she came from and then there's also um yeah the medicine in the womb absolutely and so i really find um there's a there's a lot of possibility diving in yeah yeah you know womb healing i think is something that all women go must go through and even men like i don't think that this is something that you know, we're, we're in whatever gender, you know, we associate with in this lifetime, but like, we have lots of experiences that, you know, relate to, you know, the, the counterpart. Like, you know, like I said, we have the divine masculine, divine feminine within us, but especially when you think about the womb, we've all come from a womb. We all are part of a womb, the earth mother, you know, her womb of creation. We are just organisms on this being that is, you know, the earth. Um, and there's so much room healing to be done. And I've been finding that, you know, I, when I started really digging into myself and doing some shadow work, you know, I found that I thought what I thought was like problems with my digestion and, you know, probably more around my solar plexus. 
was really all my sacral chakra. That was exactly where everything was seated, was this idea of, you know, womb issues. And I've been clearing that. And I found that, you know, once I, not that I've completely cleared, but once I really cleared my own, I started feeling like I was going into my mother's womb and I was being able to clear that trauma and like, you know, go towards a lineage. Like I, as you said last week, you know, you could feel your ancestors breathe a sigh of relief. And that's what I felt like there was a clearing that happened. And I think that there is generational as well. It's not just, you know, societal and, you know, it's a constant clearing. And when we're blocked in there, when we're blocked at the womb, this is when, you know, we have issues that are, you know, leading us towards, from what I understand, that are more addictive. You know, there's addicted, addicted to sex, drugs, gambling, whatever it is, you know, there's so many things that you can be addicted too but there's this need to kind of seek something on the outside to fulfill and it's because we're not being fulfilled you know within ourselves and i don't think that this is related to the sacral alone i think that we carry the baggage from our root chakra from the that you know that it's you know they're they're interrelated i mean all of our chakras are but like especially there that we carry that baggage and it can prevent us from really um experiencing life there's the affirmation for the sacral chakra, which is that I I feel, you know, I feel. And mm -hmm. that's what we begin to feel. And if you think about it, that's like, you know, that is our sexuality, that idea of feeling. Yeah. Feel creative, you know, when all of these things, this is creativity. Yeah. So I am cutting open this butternut squash. Um, and, you know, this is something that I've done beforehand, but I just wanted to show you one of the things, and the, there's only really two things that you need to do to prep for this recipe. One is just so the hard to cut, cut, right? Huh? Is Say it that again? Is it hard to cut? Um, you know, it, it depends on the butternut squash. This one wasn't so difficult. You oh, just okay. let me do that one. Yeah. Use a chef's knife. Yeah. You know, my, yeah, my job. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, you know, what I love, like, here's a perfect example here. This butternut squash has already sprouted the seeds. Yeah. Um, I talk about seeds a lot because seeds are part of this. This is where we store our seeds, and this is where we regenerate life. Butternut squash seeds, I'll tell you, are better than pumpkin seeds. When you roast them like pumpkin seeds, they're so good. Mm. They're also really good if you dry them out, and you can plant them, and they grow. I mean, the fact that they're growing inside of the squash itself will tell you how quickly they sprout. Wow. So, so this is the only thing that you need to do in advance. Now, I have one cooked over here that we're going to use. But, you know, what you basically do is you slather this in oil, you know, get all sensual with your butternut squash, slather it in oil. Um, I use coconut oil. Put it uh, face down in a baking tray. So I'm just going to put it like that. And you're going to bake it at 350 degrees for, you know, 40 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour, whatever it is that it takes for the squash, you know, stick a butter knife in it. And when it's, you know, when you can pierce it, that's when you know it's done. Take it out, let it cool, and then um, it'll be ready for the recipe. Right. All right. Um, the other thing I have here are um, carrots. Now, carrots are, you know, obviously being orange, what, you know, <laughs> they're great in terms of color therapy. They provide nutrients. I really also like adding things to this risotto to give it texture, you know, and I like using whole foods, you know, the roasting of a carrot. Carrots have so much sweetness and so many vitamins in them. And when you roast them whole like this, you can see what I've done is I've just chopped off the green. And, you know, I'm going to use this green. You can, like, use it in your stock if you want. I'm going to actually use this to make a pesto. We mm -hmm. talked about that a little, little bit last week. And, um, and I actually, my daughter asked if we could make a, a video of pesto. So I think we're going to make another little video together. And we're going to make a pesto out of these carrot greens. But um, you can, you know, just leave a little bit of the green on top. And I think it just adds a nice, like, beautiful presentation uh, quality to it. And I also leave the roots. You can see that, you know, these are, 
when we chop off the tops and the bottoms, it's more for uniformity and it's more for presentation. And there's nothing wrong with the whole fruit. Like I did not peel these carrots. I just washed them. I washed them really well. And, you know, then you, you're you left with, you know, the beautiful little thing that nature has given you. Like we peel and dice and do all these things for a presentation. But I do believe there's a beautiful presentation in the brownness as well. I love it. It seems very symbolic to just, yeah. like, right? Like, don't chop off the top or the roots. Like, let the carrot be the carrot, right? Let it be itself. Let it be yeah. its own thing itself. And as you can see, like, you know, there's there's beautiful, like, variety of carrots now when you get all these things. I love purple carrots. They're orange wow. in the middle. Beautiful. Right? Like, yeah. it's just... There's so much beauty in the food. And like when we really start to like go outside of our comfort zone, just, you know, go when you're at the grocery store or farmer's market, pick up something that you haven't played with before. Ask them, like ask the, you know, the person like who's dealing with produce or, you know, the person at the farmer's market, like, what do you do with this? And they'll give you recipes. And that's, mm -hmm. it's fun. That's great. Okay. So basically what I'm going to do is once these um, mushrooms are marinated, uh, about 20 minutes or so, then I'm going to put them in the, the baking dish, and I'm going to put the carrots in the same baking dish, because they can all roast together. Um, it takes about 20 minutes. And now we can get started on the sunflower seeds. Um, so the only other thing that you need to do in advance is to um, soak sunflower seeds. So here I have two and a half cups of sunflower seeds. You can see it's quite a bit. Um, this will serve about four. Uh, and you want to soak them in two tablespoons of water. I'm sorry, water with two tablespoons of salt. And it's it's just going to when you you don't have to add the salt, but you know it's kind of like adding salt to pasta water. You are um, reducing the salt that you need to put on at the end. It kind of enhances the flavor. Um, and what I do with this water because there's nothing wrong with this water, so I might save this water for something like a stock. Because what, what you'll see is that, you know, but you know, I, this is, I, I'm all about like reusing and preservation and, or I might use it to water my plants or do something like that. Partially because, you know, there's, there's no need for waste if we don't, yeah. if we don't have to do it. And, if, you well, know, and there's all that good energy in the water. Yeah. With the seeds and the salt. Absolutely. And, you know, there's good energy in the water, and there's also that concept of, like, what nutrients do we need? Like, if you are boiling a vegetable, think of all the nutrients that get lost in that water. Yeah. So, right. that water and use them. And well, my grandmother used to drink the water that she would use to steam broccoli. Yes. She would save it and drink it. Yeah. Nice smelly water, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I know. It's um it's really nice. I'm sorry, I'm just checking comments really quickly. Oh, it's nice to see. There's so many people on. It's nice to see you guys. Thanks for joining. I feel like maybe I'm having problems with my um comment section, but I think I'm good. It's fine. Uh, it'll, it'll come up. Okay, so the, to make a risotto, it's going to be the same thing that you do to make a regular risotto. So regular risotto is made with real rice. Um, I was given this rice, I don't know, maybe six years ago <laughs> by somebody, and I've, I've used it once because, honestly, I don't need to make anything with white rice. There's nothing wrong with white rice, but, like, when we can have whole grains and can do other things, why not? So I actually make risotto with brown rice and sunflower seeds and other things. Um, what the, what makes a risotto so good is kind of that starchiness that comes from it, and that's why people use arborio rice. And so you can use that. It's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just, you know, lacking the fiber and the nutrition, so why not use other things? Um, so to start off, like, you know, like a risotto, you can flavor it however you want. And the basic uh, foundation of a risotto is the best garlic and onions, which are such an important aspect of our health. Um, they have so many health properties, and I think that we take it for granted in terms of like what garlic and onions do for us. They provide so much to food, but um, 
they really are like a foundation of our health. So I say that you can never have too much. I think there are some people who probably would be a little turned off by the amount of garlic I might do sometimes, but you know, you can adjust it to whatever you want. <laughs> um, I love garlic so, onion. I know, right? I mean, garlic yeah. is one of the most potent superfoods there is in terms of um, health. Uh, it has so many health properties, and I think I mentioned this at some point, but, um, you know, garlic is actually one of the most medicinal foods that is out there that um, it's known to really bring us into our body. Mm. And I, uh, I say that, like, it, it keeps us in our body because it's really focused on the body healing and body health. And, um, you know, when I'm making food, like, I love to add garlic, but if I'm making fire cider and other, you know, different things, I really think about the amount of garlic I put in because it keeps us in our body, but it actually prevents us from doing things like um, astrally traveling or lucid dreaming. It can actually keep us in our body. And there's nothing wrong with that when, when we need healing. But you want to make sure that, you know, you're not obstructing your own desire to leave your body if there's times that you want to actually practice that kind of work. Mm. So I am sauteing these onions that I just used some coconut oil. And we're going to get them to the point that they're translucent a little bit. And then what I'm going to do is I'm also going to add some, we're using shiitake as shiitake bacon. But I'm also going to add shiitake to the base of this because, um, you know, it, it adds, as I said, that wonderful umami flavor, and it's going to give it that robustness. Otherwise, what happens is I've made this sun, um, the sunflower seed risotto without it, totally tastes fine. It's wonderful. But I feel like there's a depth of flavor when you add a little bit of that umami, and I get that from shiitake. The wonderful thing about cooking is that this is where you get to be creative and this is where you get to express yourself. So like play with it, make it your own in whatever way you like. That's the best part of cooking, right? Like it's a playground that you just get to express it and you know, you get to take food and it like alchemizes into something that's completely different, you know, like the way the flavors meld together and like, so just keep playing. That's what I highly, highly recommend. That's great. Hmm. What are you looking at, Benita? Um, I was just looking at like, what is, if I was missing anything in my steps here. Oh, but, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I was just going to say I I learned how to make, you know, some foods from my grandmother. Oh, yeah. And every recipe starts with garlic and onion mm -hmm. sautéed in oil or butter. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like most things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting. I mean, I, I don't I don't I just I have some big pieces here. Well, so I'm taking those out. Um, but one of the things that I have found is that no matter what culture that you're in, you'll find that garlic and onions are like a foundation of food. Um, and then the variation comes in in like how they are prepared, you know, in terms of, I know for Indian food, for example, um, you're going to first like fry the spices and then throw them in. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that's really important to remember when cooking um, garlic and onions is that a lot of recipes that we will see that will say, um, there's a lot of recipes that you will see that will uh, talk about adding garlic in with the onions or like soon after the onions. Garlic turns really bitter when it's cooked. So you don't want to add it in too soon. You actually want to add it in like towards the end or like the end of like, the cooking process with the onions before you're adding a whole bunch of other vegetables. So, oh, that's really helpful. Yeah, it really turns bitter, and it actually the healing properties and all the nutritive properties are lost by, um, you know, it becoming rancid. And I don't think that that's well understood. So okay. make sure that you're not adding the garlic early in the cooking process. It really, it really should be added later. Gosh, I just love crispy garlic from the frying yeah. pan. <laughs> uh, crispy garlic, do that as a separate thing, you know? Yeah. Like, there's nothing wrong with frying up some garlic and 
having that crunch and that flavor come through mm -hmm. like that. But mm -hmm. just think about like, you know, and you, you can play with it in your food. You will taste that burnt garlic once you, you become, you know, when you when you start paying attention to how it's how it's uh you know when it's added, you'll start to notice that flavor difference. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yep. So tell me, what have you been finding? Like when you when you are out of balance in your sacral chakra, like what comes up for you? What kind of issues? Um, well, you were talking about addiction, so I definitely find that I'm more mindlessly reaching for something, probably because I'm not feeling what I'm feeling, but on right. some level it's simmering and I'm yeah. uncomfortable, and so I'm like probably going to reach for something. Um, so I notice when I'm doing that, I'm like, okay, something's going on. I should probably check in. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I find that too, where it's, uh, you're looking outside yourself. And I think this has to, this is what that idea, this is our relationship to the world when we move away from like that tribal association to yeah. the external association with the world. If we're not stable, if we're not comfortable in our expression of who we are, like this is really the seat of authentic, creative, expression of who we are and how we share that with the world. If we're not stable in that area, if we're not clear in that area, it can manifest as us reaching to the outside in order yeah. to find that solution and try to stabilize it. But in the end, it just yeah, and I think like the reach is, you know, I think that it's a reach for connection. It's a reach for co-regulation. It's a reach for relationship. It's a reach. The reach is in and of itself like a striving connection or making contact with something, right? Um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That relational, exactly relational piece. Yeah. What were you saying? I said that's exactly it, connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're seeking connection. And I think that when we've lost connection with ourselves, we've lost connection with the outside world. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it keeps, it just keeps cycling back as us trying to find connection with ourselves. But sometimes when we end up doing it, we further push that down. And that's again coming back to this concept of shadow work. Why yeah. it's so important that shadow work so that we can reestablish that connection with ourselves. Yeah. Very, um, very deep work, especially if, you know, in early childhood, um, the, the connections were confusing or chaotic um, or like disorganizing. So then yeah. that, that search for self really does become the work, you know, relationship with self. I've, um, you know, I've had this thought for a long time and, you know, I definitely see this amongst others that uh, or others say the same thing. You know, our society is really lost in um, this instability that we have in our root and sacred chakras, you know, in, our, in those centers. You know, we are descending beyond that to some degree. The lower half of, um, you know, our chakra system with our heart being the center right? Like our heart is where we have that connection to, you know, um, as above, so below. And, you know, we feel with our lower and we express with our higher. That's mm. where we start to, you know, express ourselves. And because we've numbed our feeling, we've numbed ourselves out of feeling. We don't want to feel because it can be painful to, be, to feel that yeah. we, we've kind of lost ourselves as a area. What are you touching here? I am, I am, I'm fondling the mushrooms. Yes, you are. <laughs> fondling the shiitake over here. So yeah. you can see they're, you know, they're coated. They're coated really well. Now, you can leave this for as long as you'd like. Um, the longer you leave it, the more it kind of like penetrates inside of the mushroom itself. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to stick these into the oven. They're still going to be great. Uh, and you want to make sure that like everything is fully coated so that, you know, they, they just have that robust flavor. So I'm going to put it into a baking tray here. 
Um, I just have they're they're just in a single layer, so that you know there there's not really much to do with that. I'm also going to put the carrots, um, and I am going to just um, give the carrots like a quick spray with some coconut oil, and I just roast them so that they are facing up a little bit like this, you know. Putting them on the sheet tray or the pan, whatever you're using. Um, and like I said, they can just roast with the shiitake. They're all going to be one dish, and mixing of flavors is good. You want to mix. <laughs> um, so, how did you how did you come upon this um, particular creation? You know. This is what it's taken me a long time to realize. And, you know, in my journey of self-discovery and healing, um, you know, I, I just realized that, like, my mind naturally likes to think of creations with food. I look at the plate. The plate is, um, so I'm just picking that in the oven, 400 degrees, about 20 minutes. I'm um, going to set a timer here because I tend to be absent-minded. And my timer is not working, so I got my R2-D2. <laughs> you guys can keep me on. Um, Jenny says she likes it to penetrate inside. I agree. <laughs> I definitely agree. Um, but I, I always saw the, you know, the plate as like an empty plate with my white canvas. And I just love to create something that is both functional and tasty and nutritious, like functional in the sense that we need to feed our body, provide it the, what it needs, healthy because we can do that in a multitude of ways, but we, we have our own individual constitutions. We're unique individuals and our own constitutions and what we need is going to vary. So doing in a nutritious way for the self. And you know, it, it needs to be creative and flavorful. So a lot of my creations come about through me depriving myself of something. So if I say, I can't use grains, or I can't use this, and I start craving something, then I'm like, how can I create that? How can I create that in a way that will make me happy? So I think it was, like, I think I did, like, a, a Whole30 challenge at some point last year. Or, no, sorry, not last year. Three years ago. <laughs> and, okay. Um, like three, three years ago or so, and um, you know you can't use any grains in that, and it's really interesting. I don't ever really get a craving for Chinese food, and of course during the whole thirty challenge, I was like, I crave Chinese food. So I created a lo mein using you know zucchini noodles and things like that, and I was like, it needs something. It needs like a crunch or something. And um, that's when I decided to make shiitake bacon. And I don't know how that came to me. I feel like, you know, 90% of our creativity is downloads from our spirit guides of the universe or higher self. And, you know, it was just experimenting with it and made the discovery of liquid smoke. So um, the stock that I showed you that I made, um, you know, I've warmed some up. That's one of those things with risotto. Now, uh, it just helps you, you know, cook quicker when it's warm. It does not have to be warm like it does in the sense of when you're using rice because this cooks a lot quicker than rice. When you're cooking with rice, whether it be a whole grain rice or um, like, you know, brown rice or arborio rice, you want to be sure to use something like a wooden spoon because it's uh, going to release starches and you want to make sure that um, you're not pushing around the starch and making it kind of gummy. But in the case of, you know, this, because it doesn't take as long to cook the sunflower seeds, it, it you know, it doesn't have to be warm, but it just makes the cooking time easier. Nice. So I'm seeing that um, your lo mein recipe is uh, wanting, people want that. Oh, yeah, I will definitely. So back when I was being crazy and working like 80 hour weeks in corporate with you know a newborn child and um and i was and you know and i was probably somewhere between the ages of zero to two and i um you know you know what it's like as a mother being a mother yourself that that loss of identity that you have mm -hmm. you know and all of my 
all of my identity was being poured into my daughter or my work. And my work is not like there are some people who, you know, can do their work as their identity, but me being in corporate, what I was doing in scientific communications for pharma and biotech was not me. It was not my identity at all. This was just something I was good at. It was quite lucrative, but it was killing my soul. And what I found is that the the creativity through food was um, how I expressed myself. That was my sacral chakra manifesting itself. And that was when I really began to uh, create these recipes. And I posted, um, I created a blog. It was called The Purposeful Kitchen. Mm. Uh, you can find it at thepurposefulkitchen.com. I will post that as well. Um, Forgive any kind of lengthiness in those blogs because I was definitely a sleep deprived person posting these things to the best of my ability <laughs> while creating at the same time. Um, I would stay up all night just to express myself, you know, and then wake up and go to work. And it was quite brutal. <laughs> you're, you're so wonderful at expressing yourself in writing and cooking and. Even your um, choice of clothing and jewelry. Thank you. That has yeah. always been my, I think, my expression. And it's one of the ways that, you know, we, I found that. And, you know, coming back to the conversation we were having in the beginning about, you know, what's happening right now in this, um, this concept of, like, what is racial identity and, you know, this, this concept of a society forcing us to be the same and, you know, whether, you know, we assimilated that to the patriarchy or just, you know, the idea of being white, whatever. There's lots of different ways that we're all trying to be boxed into the same thing. I found that that was where I really struggled was walking into a work environment and being myself. I had to hide my tattoos. I couldn't wear the type of clothing that I would normally wear. Mm -hmm. The type of jewelry I would wear was just not well respected. The things that I wanted to talk about, like if there was an unjustified murder of somebody i want to be able to talk about that but we always had to keep this mm. wall up that well these are the things we don't discuss in this life but if we don't discuss these things with each other as human beings where are we going to discuss it what is the appropriate place we're not supposed to discuss it around a dinner table we're not supposed to discuss it at work we're not supposed to discuss it in company of others where are we supposed to discuss it yeah. right yeah. and so I think that this is what's really important with, uh, you know, this concept of bringing back conversation and allowing people to express who they are. And what better place than a meal, right? Isn't mm. that where we're supposed to gather and have conversation with one another about mm. our lives and who we yeah. are? Well, I remember you were hosting a series of meals at your home, right? Where you would you would curate your people, right? And you choose the topic. Yeah, that was again one of my crazy endeavors, but a, an act of creativity. That was mm -hmm. definitely in my womb. Birthing yeah. ideas. And it was beautiful. You would present a really important um, issue happening in um, our social reality and you would post the question and you would invite people to share and dialogue while we're eating your incredible food. Yeah, it was my food as protest parties. Yeah. Food and fundamental rights. And this was right after the 2016 election. And mm -hmm. after, you know, after I went through my whole scare and anger and everything, I realized that I wanted to express myself through conversation. What happened was this lack of conversation that um, happened in our in, in the world. We, we ended up with the results of 2016 and where we are today because we weren't willing to discuss with one another this difficult subject. So yeah. what I did was I created um, a dinner party that was hosted right here at that table. And it was, I invited people who didn't know each other from different parts of my life. And the point was to discuss difficult topics. And so there was one where we discussed, um, I think I called it America's melting pot of oppression. <laughs> and like, you know, this idea of like what it means to be um, in the society that, you know, proclaiming to be this melting pot, but have we really integrated and simmered together 
or are we just disparate ingredients, you know? And mm -hmm. I would craft menus that were based on that subject. I think I used cauliflower because cauliflower is a vegetable that can be um, made to, you know, can be manipulated in a lot of different ways, can be used in so many different, um, like as a main dish, as a side dish, as like a, and so it was used in multiple ways to uh, basically highlight the fact that you can take something and change it and, um, you know, it can be transformed into something, but it always retains what it is. And it's about how you can, you know, harmonize together. I think that I also chose cauliflower because it's one of those ingredients across the board in a lot of different cultures. What was that? It cut out. Seen in a lot of different cultures, mm. cauliflower. Mm. But anyway, I did also like, you know, we did discussion about what is, you know, what does it mean to be, you know, you know, just I think it was like um, LGBTQIA. There was, I don't know. And after a while, I kind of petered out because it's a lot to, <laughs> it's a lot to do. I also yeah. post that. I think that um, I would post those conversations and the recipes. And that was under, I think that was foodandfundamentalrights.com. But yeah. So I, I believe that, you know, food is a vehicle for storytelling. We tell a lot about our cultures and who we are, who we are today, where we've come from. We tell, like, as you were saying with your grandmother's recipe, the story of our history, where our foundations are. You know, I sometimes believe that half of my recipe ideas are coming because my ancestors, my grandmothers are giving me these recipes. These are not my own, you know. And they're showing me how I can incorporate my culture into something that is here today. Um, so just very quickly, what I've done here is I've added um, the mushrooms to the onions. And they're just sitting here sauteing. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take the sunflower seeds. I've drained the water. I'm going to take about three-fourths of the cup of the sunflower seeds, and I'm going to blend it. And I'm going to blend it with um, some of the beds, the stock that I made. So like, you know, just enough stock to keep it liquid. I'm also going to scoop out the butternut squash that was roasted and put that in there. And mm. use some sage, some thyme, some um, rosemary. I mean, you know, you can always buy these um, oregano. You know, I dry the herbs like... Or, you know, I think every witch has a rosemary bush somewhere, right? <laughs> rosemary is a magical, magical um, herb here, so you can easily grow. If anybody wants a cutting to grow rosemary, I'm happy to give it to them. Sage is wonderful, California natives, right? Drought resistant, so I make my own sage bundles. I burn them one, one leaf at a time. I also dry them for cooking. You can definitely buy your own um, at the grocery store, which is wonderful. We have these things available to us. So I'm just going to quickly blend that. That's going to make some noise. Um, make some uh, noise, Anita. <laughs> <laughs> my Vitamix over here so we can do that. So the reason that I'm blending the sunflower seeds in this, so as I mentioned that, you know, the rice has starch, and that's kind of what gives risotto its structure, that kind of like creaminess. But the sunflower seeds don't have that same starch. So by blending some of it, you can get that, that quality of risotto. And then the butternut squash is adding some sweetness, some fiber, uh, some flavor. Sunflower seeds are great for the omegas. Um, I think it's more rich in omega-6. And so, um, you know, and I know that the omegas are good for the sacral chakra. Again, it's another way that we look at healing and um, you know, that comes through the womb, you know, all these, think about like the vitamins that we take as women, a lot of it are um, different vitamins that are essential for things like bone health and blood health and reproductive health. So this is where I like to get the cut and seeds with the Black seeds, sunflower seeds, you know, sunflowers are not really, it's a, it's a different kind of seed, but um, sesame seeds. MC, all of those. So I'm just basically scooping out this butternut squash, tossing it in here. Okay, and then I'm going to add some thyme. And as you can see, I am literally loosening the bowl with this all. You just add what you feel 
add to your taste, whatever spice you like the most, whatever you like the most, add that in. Um, so I've added thyme, oregano, this is a little bit of thyme. And I'm going to add some rosemary. All right. All right. I'm going to take some stock. Um, now, like I said, you just you don't want this to be too liquidy, just enough to blend to get kind of like a creamy texture. But it won't take long. Process your vitamins, whatever you have. Um, you can taste that afterwards, and if you need to add salt to it, you can. Otherwise, add salt to um, the dish at the end. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. a little more stock. And as your onions and your um, mushrooms, the shiitakes, are cooking, you just want to, um, if you find that there is... <laughs> Can you hear me over that noise? <laughs> sort of. No. like creamy texture doesn't take long but if you find that you know i don't know if you can see this here but there's a little bit of brownness in the pan right that yeah. is the caramelization of the onions that's all the sweetness you don't want to lose any of that that's the yummy stuff so just add a little bit of stuff and let that you know let that kind of and then push it around so you can actually get some of that caramelization that's going to give it a really really beautiful taste that's when you get that um, you know, that's when you know onions are cooked well, when they can be, when they can have, release that sweetness and you get it into your food. Mm. So, hungry. <laughs> All right, next thing I'm going to do now is add the sunflower seeds. So these are just smoked sunflower seeds. And they get added in, and we're going to get out of there with some stock. Now, you can actually cover this as you want. Um, like I'm using a big pan that's traditional for risotto because you want the you want the liquid to evaporate. But in this case, you don't, and you don't want this to be runny. But you don't have to use a giant pan like this. You can definitely use a pot or a smaller pan, whatever you have. There's no need to get extra equipment or things like that. The beautiful thing about soaking the sunflower seeds overnight is that it's going to make them softer and it's going to give them some of the you know that kind of you know, pre-cook. And when you put it on the fire, when you put it on the flame, it doesn't need to cook that long because you want to kind of keep them a little bit al dente. You want to have that, that nice crunch to it. So just keep stirring. I am, looks, looks like R2G2 is going to be going up two minutes left, so I'm going to check um, on the shiitake bacon. And what I'm going to do is just give them a quick turnover. Sounds good. Anybody have any questions in the meantime? I've been talking a lot. <laughs> I think everyone's getting, everyone's drooling, actually. Oh, yeah. I know <laughs> I am. Oh. All right, so this bacon's a little, a little extra time here. So, you know, it takes about, you know, anywhere, depending on. <laughs> Um, you know, how long and how crispy you want it. I like my bacon crispy, so I tend to cook it until it gets really thin and crispy. Um, but you can, you know, at this point, it's cooked and it's, uh, you know, it's good and it, it can go if you want. So anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes, I can, it can take as long as 40 minutes depending on the texture you want. Just keep an eye on it. And so now this is cooking away. And going to let this go. Hi. Hi. Uh, I know this is the one thing that I don't know how to give people is natural food at the end. Oh my gosh, right? It's like bordering on painful. I 
know, I know. But the beautiful thing is I try to create these so that they're simple enough that anybody can make it. So the thing that I forgot to add in is the garlic. But like I said, you don't want it to come up anyway. So it's totally fine that it went in at the end. The other thing that you can do with the garlic is you can blend it. Um, you can like take a couple cloves and blend a couple cloves if you want it to be really garlicky. If you just want like, a subtle hint of garlic, you know, you can cook with that. So I'm adding about five cloves. Now, how I garlic is a pain, so I like to smash it. I and love then, the smashing. Yeah, get out that aggression. Get out. I all love that. it. So smash it, and then you just peel it off very easily that way. And then I save the peels in the bag for my veggie stock. So don't forget all the nutrients and all the things that we normally discard. You don't want to get rid of them. You can eat them all. Or drink them all, I should say, because it comes in a stock. <laughs> and you know, that's the thing. Like a lot of a lot of the um, times when you know you get a stock made, it's usually whole vegetables that are thrown in. They're not peeled, they're not. Mm -hmm. it's everything that's thrown in there. So this is making it all that the stuff you would throw away. So that was, yeah, that that was awesome. yeah, I I mean I was just so blown away by that. And so I made my own and it was the best stock I've ever made. And it only took 40 minutes. Nice. So nice. I'm used to I'm used to like doing a bone broth for hours and hours and hours and hours, right? Yeah. Really, this was the best. It was delicious. Yeah, I mean, a bone broth, you definitely need those hours, right? Yeah, so you're, you're sure. Getting water there. Mm -hmm. um, and this is nice, a nice quick fix. And you know, when you add in things like shiitake stems, like, you know, if you, you make the shiitake bacon and you use shiitake and umami and, like, you know, any food that you eat, you will find that you will get that kind of, like, you know, I make vegetarian bone broth equivalents, you know, using mushrooms. Mushrooms and combo and all these different, you know, the combo is really good for the seaweed, getting all the nutrients, and you'll find that robustness in flavor. It's obviously going to be different from bone broth, but you're getting that, in the end, what you're getting out of bone broth is the umami. Love it. And the nutrients. Okay, so I've added five cloves of garlic to this. Nice and garlicky. I don't know if you can see here, but uh, basically just letting the, the liquid evaporate. Um, and, you know, typically you don't see things like, you know, shiitake in a risotto. And that's that's what I like to play with food. And that's why I like to draw from different cultures. You know, I like to learn, like, what are the flavor profiles of foods in different places, and different cultures. Because it's amazing what you can add. I mean, you can, I don't. I remember the first time I had like the combination of Japanese flavors with Italian flavors was um, in France of all places. And it was a pizza place that put miso and shiitake on a pizza. And mm. I was blown away. I was like, why haven't I thought of this, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I make my Indian pizzas, but you really can, um, you know, when you mix, when you mix the flavor combinations of different cultures, like, you get the most beautiful food. And I like to look at, when I look at cooking for the chakras, like there's like I was talking about, the concept of cooking based on color, you know, using the foods based on color, but also using the properties of that chakra. So like, you know, as I was saying, like we're talking about seeds, we're talking about womb, we're talking about fertility, planting seeds for, you know, who we are, our relationship to the world. So in that sense, you know, using sunflower seeds connection to others using the, the mushrooms. So, you know, I like to think about the qualities of it. And when you're putting the intention, then you're you're using that intention to clear that area. You can also look at nutrients. I mean, they say like the omegas are, you know, the omega three, sixes and nines, um, those nutrients are really good for the sacral chakra. And so again, that comes from seeds. And so it's interesting to kind of see nature produce those things in those foods that you eat for that, mm. for that part of our body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. How are you doing over there? Can you smell this? <laughs> oh it looks so good, Vanita. What's what we need is a smell of it. But I... You know, I, I just want to, like, emphasize that, you know, these, like, sometimes when you see 
dishes that are posted and it seems so complicated, they're really not that hard. They are simple. And so just give it a try and make it your own. Oh, it looks like there are lots of people that I have missed joining us. And I am so grateful for all your comments here. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm glad you're all salivating and I wish I could give this to you, but I promise you one day when we are all of not physically distancing anymore, I'm happy to cook a large dinner for everybody. Oh, that would be so great. I want to get back in your kitchen. Yeah, I mean, community is, is everything, right? And it's that yeah. connection, that connection to self, that connection to others. And like, this is again why I keep saying that. The things that we're going through as a, as a humanity, as a society, are all dealing with our root and sacral chakra, right? Like yeah. this idea of withdrawing and isolating. And like these are these are uh, manifestations of unhealthy in our root and sacral chakra. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing when you were asking me, I, I can't remember exactly what you asked, but like what how do I know when I'm out of balance in my sacral? Mm -hmm. Right. And so realizing that there's that reach and then to make a reach for human connection, I find is so stabilizing and so regulating for me. Yeah. So calling a friend, even connecting with my daughter, like even just focusing in on our relationship can be so stabilizing for me. And I forget that sometimes. That connecting, just connecting can be stabilizing, like you just want to withdraw into yourself. Yeah, or like I'm disconnected from myself and that by connecting with someone else, it brings me back into myself. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, it's so true. Like That's something that I tend to do is I like naturally tend to self-isolate. I don't tend to talk to people. And then I find that when I do talk to people, it's amazing how I'm able to clear a lot of the blockages within myself because part of it is me speaking it out. You know, really releasing it by taking that internal chatter and thinking consciously about how I would say that and what it means to me. Sometimes that clears it. And yeah. then other times it's just having that, like, reflection back at me. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so I just tasted this and I put some salt in here. So I encourage you to taste some salt. <laughs> So you had asked me earlier where I got the inspiration for a sunflower seed potato, and now I remember. I think it was a Top Chef episode. I oh. love cooking shows, and uh, one of my favorite chefs, Brian Voltaggio, had made um, a sunflower seed risotto, and I'm like, sunflower seed risotto? Like, I have to do that. And so that's when I just kind of figured it out. He didn't give a recipe or anything like that, but it was just a concept. Sometimes that's all you need is that spark of inspiration to create, get those creative juices flowing. Definitely. Um, so it made me think of, you know, all those chefs out there that are always like, taste your food along the way, taste mm -hmm. every step, every component. So uh, just taste and see what it means. So I'm going to check how well cooked this is. Oh. Mm. Nice and al dente. Now, this is the point when you can decide how al dente you want that. Right. I'm going to call this good. Partially for the sake of time and partially because it tastes good. <laughs> and that could have been us. Now I'm just going to add this um, butternut squash um, sunflower seed sauce that I made. Mm. Oh my gosh. And we're going to cook this down just a little bit more and then we're going to plate it up. All right. So now this is, oh, go ahead. Is your family going to get to enjoy that meal? I think so. They'll enjoy a little bit. Um, but I really wanted to make this um, for uh, some friends of ours who've been kind enough to, you know, offer up their backyard um, as a space, like, where there are some children that can interact in a socially responsible way and have, like, a learning environment. And, you know, I... I'm really um, amazed at them. You know, they're they're just they're a wonderful family as it is, and 
I had heard um, the woman say that, the mother, you know, say that she was eating a lot of like quick foods that she was preparing from the freezer. So I thought it would be nice to share a homemade meal with them. That's you know, to give them something so that they can have that's fresh. That's um, so you can see now, it's, you know, got that kind of like, you know, more creamy quality to it now. Um, I'm going to plate this up so you can see what it looks like. We're going to top it with some of the shiitake bacon and some of the carrots. Um, they can keep roasting, um, you know, I'm, but I'm going to do this for the sake of time because I think that they're, you know, it's one of those things where this becomes a sense of like, what do you like? How do you like your food? Now, um, as you can see, can I get some up here? Um, one of the things that I am a very uh, strong advocate of is adding green to your food. I really do believe that there is something about green. You know, we get it in our leafy greens. There's things like peas. Here I have peas. But we should always eat not only with our taste buds, but all of our senses. So smell, sight, you know, that's why I say touch your food, play with it. And I, I had a realization today that one of the reasons that I think I like to add green to all of my food, like if you see me, I put arugula and salad greens and everything on, on everything, but um, is because it does represent the heart chakra. Mm. And this is where our center of who we are as humans is. Like this is our connection to above and below. This is our connection to each other. This is our connection to help to each other. And when we are thinking and feeling with the heart, we really are living our most authentic selves and in harmony with, you know, nature and with each other. So I think I do. I, I just had that realization today. It was something that I hadn't thought about before. Now, in this case, I'm adding green peas. I'm, you know, I don't always, you know, you can blanch. Like if you get fresh green peas, like Trader Joe's sells bags of fresh green peas. You can quickly blanch those in a pot of boiling water. Um, you can use frozen peas. If you use frozen peas, just, you know, dehydrate them. You can add them to the cooked risotto, if you like, or just put them on top. I like mine to be not so um, cooked. And then you can top this with all this wonderful goodness. Now, typically, I would let this cook a little longer. I'm going to show this to you. you can see what it is. Um, you can see that, you know, it's starting to get crispy, but it's not quite at its full crispiness yet. So I would probably give this like, you know, 20 more minutes or so, but for the sake of time, we're just gonna use it because the flavor is there. It's mm. just that nice crispiness of bacon that um, would be different um, as shiitake bacon. So in this case, because I cut them a little thicker and marinated it a little shorter, it's, uh, you know, it's taking a little long in cooking time, but in the end, it's all going to taste great. Because I, I've made this a thousand different ways and it comes out good. <laughs> and we're going to have some beautiful roasted carrots here. You can see how, like, you know, the carrots are nice, whole, and roasted. And, you know, like yeah. I said, I feel like there's a beauty having that whole, whole carrot, skin and all, and you get all the nutrients that are there. And, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. That's just more of a presentation thing that we've come into where we cut everything off. And then I like to top it with some microgreens. I'm using micro arugula. All, you know, plants have nutrients at different stages from seeds to microgreens all the way to full expression. So it's wonderful to have that. So you can see here, I have a bowl of the, let me see if I can angle it down here. Oh, it's but, so beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, like, it's it's amazing how you can cook for, you know, for a chakra without, like, this concept of only dealing with color alone. Think about the, the essence of the food. So in this case, we have the seeds. We've got the color from the carrots. There's butternut squash in there. There's our intention that we're putting in. There's the, the connection through the mushrooms. There's the green that represents the heart. One other thing that you can do, and again, this all comes down to taste, you know, whatever you like, whatever is your, you know, um, your taste profile, but like, I like to add a little bit of lemon zest. And, you know, we had mentioned in the last episode, that was um, something that Delia had mentioned when they were talking about chakras, 
is this idea that we not only work with the chakra that we're dealing with, we work above and below. And so, you know, this is getting into the concept of our solar plexus, right? The yellow, that bright sun. And what it does is it adds a little bit of acidity, a little bit of brightness. And so when we have these kind of strong umami flavors, this, you know, robust risotto, sometimes it's nice to have that little bit of acid. So I just zest a lemon, I'm using a microplane here, and I just take a little bit of the lemon zest itself, you know, freshly washed lemon. This is from our tree. And now you have add, you know, you've added a little bit of a color. I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's a beautiful plate of food. And like this is when you get to eat, not only from the nutrition of what you're what you're cooking, but with your senses, you know, with your sight, with your smell. And it's so wonderful to share food with other people. Oh, thank you so much, Vanita. You have a true gift. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but I, I, you know, one day I will make this all for you, but this will get posted um, on our, on the, the Facebook feed for this. And, you know, I'm really glad to be able to share this time with you, Ariel, and, you know, really discuss some of these issues that we're dealing with right now. And I'm really grateful for all of you that have tuned in. Um, I think that, you know, it's a wonderful thing to be able to really focus on the self and really work on what we need to do to heal ourselves, to heal ourselves and become into alignment within ourselves. Because when we do, we're of greater service to this world. We express our true authentic self. We find our medicine that we can give to the world. So I encourage you all to you know, explore and play with food. And I hope you try this out and let me know how it goes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Benita. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. And so don't forget next week, um, again, through this is our wonderful Witchcraft Wednesdays hosted by the Modern Witch Movement. And um, Delia and Jenny will be back to move on up through our chakras. And so um, tune in for that. And let's, you know, continue ascending. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you.